Yeah, to that extent, welcome. Um, we're going to be covering 180DC's seven-step consulting framework um, over kind of this session and the next session. Uh, it's really the core of all the work you're going to be doing within 180DC uh, with, your, with your respective clients. Uh, but yeah, to that extent, we're starting off with step one, defining the problem. So in this section, we're going to explore how to best define the problem when starting a consultant with thing assignment, right? Take a step back, the client comes to you, they're like, I have this problem. Generally speaking, that client's problem and the way they're saying it to you is gonna come from only one point of view. They're gonna not have completed stakeholder interviews and everything else we're gonna talk about. That's kind of your job in identifying the problem. Albert Einstein always said that if he has to solve a problem, 55 minutes of the time he's gonna try to figure out what the problem actually is and only 5% of the time to actually solve it. Um, to that extent, I'm not saying anyone here is an Albert Einstein, that's not the expectation, but um, you know, definitely spend a lot of time defining the problem at the beginning. Um, why does it matter? Here you have two case studies. Uh, go ahead and read through them, uh, just kind of take a minute. Um, and at the end, take a second to reflect. What do you think the situations have in common? How do you think they could be avoided? So, who has an answer here? very cogent points. Um, I mean, if you just kind of look at the last sentence here, the problem was actually due to poor operations rather than a lack of marketing. And over here, the consultant realizes that Helena should rather focus on measuring her organization's impact before seeking social investors. Um, on both fronts, you can see the same overarching issue of the consultant was hired to do something and just did that exact thing. The client might come to you and say, I have this issue and I think this is causing it. That doesn't mean that you, from the beginning, have to work on that one core causal, right? So just kind of every time someone comes to you with an issue, take a step back and evaluate. Um, in practice, we're going to go through six steps that help define a problem rigorously and systematically, and also how to address it from there. So the six steps, this is kind of the outline. I'm going to run you through all of them. Um, Point one is identifying and classifying stakeholders. Does anybody know what a stakeholder is in a given problem? Come on, make an inference. Somebody who has some sort of kind of like identification with the company, like a customer stakeholder, somebody who invests as a stakeholder, anybody who's kind of exactly. involved in that company. Exactly, anybody who is affected or involved in a given company, right? So, how do we do that? Well, because we're jazzed. Here's a formal definition there, right? Um, anyone who, it, who uh, an action has an effect on or is affected by the scope of activities being analyzed. The first step is identifying all the stakeholders related to the client's organization or specific program that, that they might be asking you to work on. Some of you guys are working on Samaritan's Purse or Rockefeller. There you're talking about a really, really large scope of what the organization works on. You're gonna be focusing on a small slice of that. Um, and from there, you want to do stakeholder mapping to map out all the different organizations, people who are affected. 
perspective, uh, the scope of activities in that respective uh, space. So to that extent, uh, there's a stakeholder mapping matrix that one ADDC uses. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, you kind of map out interest in programming success by influence on program success. Um, you know, kind of use arbitrary just knowledge, uh, and then also stakeholder interviews to um, you know identify the different ones um, and how you know what what their role kind of plays in what the program delivery is doing. So um, that's that. I'm not going to run through the example here. Um, Point two, understand their vision and long-term objectives. Okay. The second step is to understand at its core what the client wants to do in the long run, right? This is what you're doing now, but what does all of that build up to? Um, to that extent, the problem you're gonna identify and the recommendations you're gonna make are gonna differ really greatly depending on the client's aspirations, right? So you're gonna wanna ask for their one, three, five, 10 year plan. If they have one, a lot of nonprofits don't. Um, and from there, uh, try and figure out how they're solving this problem for them is gonna play into that, right? You wanna make sure that your solution is embedded and doesn't stick out uh, like crazy. So uh, that's that. Uh, understanding their current situation. Uh, you're gonna be asked to understand your client's current situation, right? At its core, what activities do they perform daily? What do they do on a weekly basis? What's their operating structure? What are some common problems they face? What are patterns in those problems, right? We're gonna get into problem mapping a little bit later in terms of you know, what material impact of problems have, but you're going to notice very quickly uh, that especially in nonprofit organizations, they have a hell of a lot of problems, right? Whether it's funding, whether it's grants, whether it's marketing, corporate functions in general, operations, impact. Seriously, nonprofits have problems with impact and impact reporting too. So take all sorts of different forms. Your job is going to be identifying what the biggest one there is and what they want you to work on. Um, when gathering this information, you're gonna discover some issues that the client may or may not have known too. So just kind of be very careful when you're um, working around those structures in the organization. Uh, to that extent, you're gonna wanna review the literature. Well, what's the literature? Nonprofit organizations, you're gonna wanna uh, try and find first off uh, their IRS filings. So uh, nonprofits file a 990 or 990EZ with the IRS every year. You can just search that up, IRS nonprofit lookup and review that so you have an idea of their financials. Um, and what's reasonable on that front. Because uh, again, some organizations have like, you know, five grand in annual funding, and then some organizations have tens of millions, and we're working with both kinds. So that's very important. Um, but also internal documentation. What does current standard operating procedure look like? Right? Have they already tried to fix this problem in the past? You're probably gonna have a report on that internally. All that type of stuff you're gonna wanna ask for and review uh, outside of meetings and then send follow-up questions either by email or through another meeting with your main stakeholder, which is your point of contact in the organization. All right, articulating the problems in a smart way. Uh, this one's actually very important, right? Once you've completed all of this work, you're gonna wanna be able to put it down on a piece of paper, and really just within one sentence, really be able to state the problem out loud, right? And uh, smart, uh, specific, measurable, action-oriented, relevant, time-related. These are all things like SMART goals, you've probably heard of that, this is a very similar concept except for the problem. Uh, in practice, this might look like this, right? How to grow the prop program so at least 20% of your eligible population is enrolled in it, in it across all states within two years. We have a time, we have a measurable, like a KPI, a key performance indicator, or OKR, it depends on the company, they use both terms. Um, you, you define what that number is, right? These are all very important parts of the problem statement. Um, and I can help you kind of refine those throughout your process as well as you kind of, you know, again, interview stakeholders and interview the client, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So next, test your problem definition with your client, right? Leaving your client out of the problem definition creates a greater risk of misinterpreting the problem. So to that extent, it's running it by them once you identify it. Um, and in the beginning stages, you're going to notice you're going to have to do a hell of a lot of communication with that client. Um, so maybe within your groups, identify one person, whether that's your PM or um, you know, a business analyst that's gonna do a lot of that outreach. Just identify someone who is that point of contact for the client. Um, a half hour face-to-face -face, uh, should do the job, really, um, or even a 15 minute phone call, like really just run it by them, make sure they're cool with it. Because um, even though you identified the problem separately from what they initially told you, the really important part is that they're okay with the work. <coughs> direction you're headed, otherwise you do eight weeks of work and then they're like, yeah, I can't do anything with this and then further report, like, you don't want that, right? Um, so, 
That's all of that. Uh, any questions about anything I just talked about? All righty, uh, final tips, there's a couple do's and don'ts. Um, analyze all the information with an open mind and question all of your assumptions. A lot of us walk in, you know, come from a certain background, walk in with preconceived notions. You can't do that in nonprofit organizations because they're, they're gonna be serving completely diverse and different you know, um, populations than you might be uh, uh, familiar with. To that extent, also engage with your clients a hell of a lot, right? They know their organization better than anyone else. They've been working there, they're the founder, they've been there for years. Um, they're gonna know the ins and outs of the space from their perspective. Again, make sure you're considering all the different perspectives. Um, and lastly, brainstorm and discuss with your teammates. Really, really important. Each of you have completely diverse experiences. You need to make sure to use that within your team, right? We place you in teams for a reason. Um, and that's because you have diverse backgrounds and experiences that you're able to contribute. It's not that one of you has all the knowledge within the team, and that's frankly probably the most important part. Make sure you include everybody in the conversation. Make sure that if the teammate's missing from a meeting, you catch them up, all that type of stuff. That, that's required for team cohesion. Um, some don'ts, right? Make sure you don't walk in thinking you know what the problem is. Uh, to that extent, also, find the problem in isolation of the client, right? You don't want to do it with the client, because when you're doing it with the client, all of their preconceived notions, all of their experiences plays in. Um, and then lastly, to find the problem in isolation of your teammates, right? Make sure you do independent thinking too and then come to the table to complete that. So, uh, any questions? Cool, uh, that concludes section one. Step two, break the problem into a bunch of different issues. Here's a fun little cartoon I saw. Um, Nathan, which one would you rather be? This guy right here or this guy right here? The one on the left, right? Exactly. Structured problem solving helps to cut the elephant into a bunch of smaller pieces. That's the important part, right? Clients often will come to you with a huge problem. Make sure you break it into smaller digestible pieces. Um, what's this look like in practice? Well, an issue treatment, right? This is the problem. Break it down into different pieces, then break it down into even more pieces. This is a house. Uh, I'm gonna go over what this looks like in practice, uh, but essentially an issue tree is a a graphical breakdown of a question or problem that dissects into a bunch of different um, components. There's a bunch of useful applications of this in the work you're gonna be doing. Uh, uh, it's most useful in really complex and amb ambiguous situations, which you're gonna face a lot at the beginning. Um, at the end of the day, uh, it's really just a you know, problem solving structure. Um, so how do we build it and how do we build a good one? There's this concept called MISI. Uh, it's something a mentor of mine always used, and I never asked him what MISI meant. Um, now I know very well. Uh, but MISI essentially stands for mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Um, in practice, mutually exclusive just means that the occurrence of one event effectively precludes the occurrence of another, right? So there's no kind of overlap, if you think of it like a Venn diagram. And then also collective exhaustion means that all possible options are listed at least once. Um, What's this look like in practice? We have two examples here. Example one, right? The issue tree for total costs is marketing costs, wages, production costs. That's not MISI, right? Many kinds of costs are missing, such as rent, raw materials, etc. So it's not collectively exhaustive. Here's another one, potential customers, old people, middle-aged people, and rich women. What's the problem there? Well, rich women can also be a part of two other groups, right? So again, that's not mutually exclusive. So you have that overlap in example two. Um, MISI is probably the most important concept you can know at the beginning, uh, especially when you're identifying all these different issues. Uh, so just make sure you make yourself as familiar with that as possible. There's a lot of resources out there. Um, and obviously, I'm also here to answer questions. Um, but to that extent, there's a couple of other um, kind of important sources of information to consider when creating one of these trees, right? Client requests, that's kind of your initial starting point. What does your client want? Okay, so you start there, then comparable organizations. Oftentimes, there's other nonprofit organizations that are doing similar things and might be more successful in certain ways than your client, right? So to that extent, be careful about looking for real peers, you know, not just the best in class, to set really attainable goals. Because uh, you don't want to compare like, um, you know, I don't know. It'd be like comparing your local community college to Harvard University and saying, yeah, we're gonna have a $40 billion endowment by you know, 2024. It's just not reasonable. 
Um, and the same thing can apply in much smaller ways to nonprofit organizations. Um, but yeah, just make sure you don't do that. Um, find social media, right? You can get a surprising amount of info from them because oftentimes clients don't clean up. You can go back like 10 years and see, well, what was going on here? Um, very informative. Um, social impact information material. Um, SSIR is really good, McKinsey Quarterly. Um, they all have like solid analyses for common problems and solutions facing nonprofits. Uh, again, my personal favorite is SSIR. If you need a subscription to that, let me know, but I think you can get it for free through Vandy. So um, yeah, but just let me know if you need an article or anything. Uh, last one is mentor research, right? If you branch uh, works with consulting mentors, uh, they're definitely sitting on a bunch of research about social impact groups, uh, so feel free to ask them for that too. Uh, there's just a bunch of stuff out there about impact quantification um, and outcomes there. So uh, why are these helpful or useful, right? Uh, at the end of the day, there's a couple of key advantages. Uh, it facilitates planning really, really effectively, right? Because it works in parallel, um, uh, uh, makes it possible to work on the same thing at once, and you'll see this as I kind of branch it out, but basically, you're in a team, right? Rather than all working on this, you can work one person here, one person here, one person here, come back to the table and say, hey, I think, uh, you know, idea two is the best way we can address the core issue. Um, so that's that. Uh, facilitates problem solving really effectively and also facilitates communication. It's all about breaking up that work at the beginning. Um, so that's really, really important. Um, to that extent, I have a little exercise here. Um, Structure the following problem by means of an issue tree. Uh, I don't see a lot of people with paper. Don't worry, I also take notes on my computer. Uh, so to that extent, I'm just gonna run you through it, but uh, how can I have more money at the end of the month without running up debts? That's the core problem in your personal life and you're trying to address it, right? So essentially we're gonna address this to go into the end product of issue, the ideas, et cetera, et cetera. What's this look like in practice? Well ask because I already did it. Um, basically, core problem, right? How can I have more money at the end of the month? Well, there's two ways you can do it. Increase income or reduce expenditures. Then there's a couple ways you can increase income, right? You can receive an unexpected windfall. You can achieve a higher income from investments or you can earn more money at work. Um, and then you can split each one of those into two ways of doing it. You can do it like the legal way or the illegal way. Work longer hours, earn more per hour, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in practice, in your little you know, teams and groups, it's gonna look like splitting these up, branching out from there, um, and also identifying which one's the most important, which I'll go over in a little bit. Um, so increasing the profit margin. This is a little bit more applied. Um, basically, the question is how can you know, this food company increase the profit margin by 2% by 2015? Again, in practice, this is what it looks like. Throw sales, reduce the cost of units. Um, so bam, bam, again. Build out from there, build out from there. Um, any questions about just kind of uh, these trees? All right, perfect. Um, so step three, prioritizing the issues, right? So you've identified all these issues, how do you prioritize them? That's a big question here. Um, it's kind of four main pillars of prioritization. There's taking risks, involving your team, using your own judgment and intuition, and doing the back of the envelope calculations. Uh, when I say back of the envelope calculations, I'm talking about data utilization. Incredibly important. Not a lot of people do it, especially if we're talking like youth run consulting groups. So just make sure if you have numbers, use them. Um, because numbers are oftentimes very, uh, very, very good um, convincing materials. Uh, to that extent, also there's this thing called the 80-20 rule. You might know it as the Pareto principle. Uh, it essentially means that 20% of the work is 80% of the output, right? 20% of the time you focus on impact, it's 80% of the benefit for problem solving. Um, you can look into this as well. The other 80% is gonna be polishing the work you do. Um, so just kind of be ready for that. Um, Pareto principles are also oftentimes applied in organizational behavior. Uh, if you've taken an OB class, uh, you've probably heard about this, like 20% of the team does 80% of the work and vice versa. Um, don't worry about which percentage piece you're in, but to that extent, you can also apply that to uh, the nonprofit world here. Um, so, prioritize issues by cutting off non essential branches, right? You're going to identify all sorts of issues with regard to the problem statement. Uh, if this one is just completely unattainable, you've got to cut it off. And ultimately, you, your goal should be to identify one or two of these. If you're identifying two, right, make sure they're kind of very closely related 
Um, or if you're identifying one, make sure it's something you can go really deep in and on. Um, but yeah, uh, the first step in constant iterative refinement processes is always just cutting off, right? You're gonna identify lots of problems, but make sure you kind of end up with one. Um, how and why, when to use prioritization? Well, basically always, um, but uh, to kind of take a step back here, right? There's a step-by-step -step guide to prioritization. You want to first off decide which items you want to prioritize, identify the dimensions you want to prioritize the issues on, um, and I'll go over that in a sec. Um, evaluate items uh, according to the identified dimension. If multiple dimensions are important, create a matrix, um, and you can even create multiple matrices and do weighted calculations, but that's, yeah, really a mistake. Um, then you also wanna start working your way down the prioritization matrix uh, as far as the resources and constraints of the nonprofit organization respectively allow. Um, so to that extent, uh, you know, in practice, uh, this kind of looks like uh, you know, step one, deciding right, the item is gonna be prioritized um, based on the issues of the issue tree um, to identifying the dimensions, right? Uh, the most common dimension when prioritizing the issues on the issue tree is impact. Um, impact or resources, again, rank the issues on the tree uh, based on this dimension matrix, um, and then also develop a working plan and start with the most kind of promising issue of the issue tree, again, all things taken into account. Uh, in practice, there's kind of a couple key characteristics to keep in mind, right? Start with the most promising issue, um, taking the available information into account, explore a bunch, right? Move to the next step and issue as soon as you have gathered enough information. And don't get lost in the details, right? Enough or not all information. Uh, to that extent too, be really flexible and adapt your current prioritization strategy based on new information learned, so continue updating. Um, and then also make the use of informal and qualitative information to secure efficient and effective working. You're gonna be dealing with a lot of qualitative rather than quantitative. Um, so in practice, uh, you know, there's a couple of examples here of prioritization matrices. Um, one is urgency versus importance. The other one is anticipated benefit versus ease of implementation. Um, any questions about these? Okay, perfect. Um, but yeah, to that extent, uh, these are just some examples. You can create your own in your team dependent upon the needs of the nonprofit. Um, <clears throat> examples for social projects, again, um, you might not always be working with an NGO under the formal 501c3 structure, so uh, this is on. Uh, you could even literally just take a piece of paper and draw it out, or like on a whiteboard during a team meeting. Um, all very plausible things. So that's that. Uh, an in-depth example of issue prioritization, right? So the core issue, how can the company reduce energy costs by 20% in the middle of next year without compromising production quality, right? Again, two main ways, cut consumption or reduce cost per unit. Um, in practice, right, y'all are gonna have a couple of these and then assign one person per uh, to kind of dive deep on that. Um, but yeah, you can kind of see how this happened. And then uh, these are the ideas for prioritization at the end of the day, because uh, they're the last ones, right? So, awesome, that's that. Uh, step two, you can plug all of that into your prioritization matrix, depending on, again, your client's needs and also your abilities. Um, and from there, uh, you kind of identify the best one, right? In this case, it's, it's four. Um, uh, you know, how much is that gonna raise it? Well, four times is the biggest, and it's gonna minimize the loss of energy, right? It addresses both issues of the problem statement. Um, so, for a issue analysis plan, right? Now that you've done all this work, well, what's the next step from there? Step 4A um, builds on kind of 4B, uh, which is a work plan, which is gonna show how to best work in teams. Um, it's rather a kind of project management tool, uh, whereas 4A is actually just showing um, you how to go about solving your client's problem. Um, so both are kind of resources for you to bring you to the end product. Um, why does it matter? The issue analysis plan helps the team answer one question. How to solve the most pressing issue that our client is facing, right? Once issues have been prioritized and selected, you can kind of see step three of the presentation again if you need to review that, we'll be sending this out after. Uh, the team needs to find a way to solve them. In this section, we're gonna kind of explore how to best develop and use an issue analysis plan, um, and then also build on that with the work plan. Uh, so this case study uh, takes a second to read through it. We're gonna be using it on the next couple of slides.
once you're done reading, uh, take a second and just pause and reflect. How could this stress have been avoided? And how could the quality of the financial report have been improved? We have our exact discussing in the front here. All right, any ideas? Ethan, any ideas? They weren't being VC. Uh, it's, it's they weren't being VC. Yeah. All right. Um, well, the financial So developing an issue analysis plan in six steps. Uh, the six steps kind of outlined, right? Point one, list the issues that your team has to solve for the client. Make hypotheses on how to solve these issues. List the elements that make you think each hypothesis is a possibility, right? Just, again, explain your reasoning. Uh, then go into the analyses, right? Explain what should be explored to confirm or refute these hypotheses, right? The, the resources data respectively if you have access to it, and then you have the end product, which is beautiful, um, right, where you specify kind of what the end product is, what your deliverable should be to the client, um, and again, this is something to run by them. Uh, but to that extent, the issue analysis plan at the end of the day is really, really helpful to ensure that all aspects of the problem we're trying to solve are being considered, um, can clarify what analyses are being conducted and how, um, and ultimately also highlight any missing sources of information on that front. So, helpful tool that you should make use of. Uh, we have outlines for this as well that we'll share with you throughout. Um, basically, I'm just going to copy paste all this into a slide and share it with your PM. Uh, but to that extent, again, right, here's the issues, hypotheses, supporting rationales, analyses, sources, and product. Any questions about this? Perfect. Um, so, for B, the working plan that you create based on all this work you do. Uh, why does it matter, right? A working plan is an essential tool that enables teams to work efficiently and track progress. This is what you're going to use for your project management throughout. Um, if you can't manage your own project, you can't deliver for the client. So this is going to be really important for your kind of internal operating structure. Though your small teams, it shouldn't be too much of a problem if you ever work in larger teams. Very helpful. Um, so case study again, same case study. Right? We walked through this earlier. Um, there's kind of four building blocks to a good working plan. Uh, in practice, right, shaping high-performing teams that use their efforts and time really efficiently. Across the board, you're gonna have different skills. One person might be really good at data analysis. One person might be really, really good at, uh, you know, prose and like good writing. So they're gonna write the client-facing reports. Another person might be great at PowerPoint. Um, I know this was the case in my case competition team. Uh, things like that, right? Tracking progress against time frames and ultimately clarifying what is expected from each team member and when. All very important things when you're on, especially on a little bit more of a crunched timeline. You know, a semester is not that much time and you have other things going on. So it's important you split that up evenly. Um, also so that you know, when you have midterms or you're having a tough week, somebody else can take the load off you. Um, so hypotheses and products, time frames, accountability. Make sure um, your working plan has those four aspects. Um, in practice, uh, here's a little bit of an expansion on those. Uh, the hypotheses are kind of just building on the issue analysis plan. It's something you can almost just paste over. Uh, the end product, right, is the second building block, which also goes back to your issue analysis plan. So you already have half of your working plan. The time frames is the really important one here, right? Once you've listed all the hypotheses and end products, think about the time frames necessary to complete them. Um, make your best educated guess. It won't be right, I promise you. It's hard to estimate, uh, so just make sure you leave some leeway uh, in between those as well. Uh, think about the sequence of tasks, right? Do some end products need to be completed before others are started? Because sometimes, again, they will be interdependent on each other, uh, so just take that into account. Uh, and then accountability, uh, make sure to attribute each of the end products to one or several team members and make sure that the work there is split up depending on, again, what 
everyone <coughs> really, really good at uh, or bad at, right? Um, so I'll just take all of that into account. Um, here's an example of what that can look like. You can literally just do it in Excel. Um, it's not too bad, right? And products, responsibility, status, timeline, um, all that stuff draw it out here. Uh, and then at your weekly meetings, you can kind of just run through this quickly and be like, yeah, what are your updates, uh, Tim? and whoever else might be thinking. So uh, just an example, uh, very easy to recreate in Excel. Uh, so conducting analyses. Now we're getting to the fun part. This is the actual consulting part. Everything before this is just getting ready. Um, so it's, again, your first, I think, two to two and a half weeks are really going to be spent just identifying um, to that extent, right? What types of analyses can you use to prove or disprove hypotheses, right? Um, at its core, really, industry reports, interview-based work, kind of very qualitative, uh, again, stakeholder interviews, stakeholder information, uh, scenario analysis, right? Uh, models should be used on reliable assumptions that can come from kind of consulting firm reports, the McKinsey, Bain, uh, Stanford Social Innovation Report, they all put out really, um, you know, really rock solid information on this front. Market research, um, analogous reasoning, sometimes needed for looking for something similar. So again, finding similar nonprofits that might be doing very similar work um, and make sure they're in the same league. You don't want to compare Rockefeller to you know, something a lot worse. And you don't want to be comparing, um, you know, again, that community college to Harvard example. Like don't, make sure it's about the same. Um, benchmarks are also really important. Um, you know, global best practices, public reports, financial statement analysis. Um, I brought up that IRS nonprofit lookup earlier. You can do the same thing for your similar NGOs. Um, so that's all very important. And lastly, media analysis, right? Has your client been in the media for anything? Uh, I was working on a case for the Wondery um, <coughs> last, last year, and I didn't do media analysis. And, uh, you know, I, I was like digging around and seeing some weird things, but I wasn't getting the full picture. And then I just like look at the news, and then I see, oh, this client has been in the media about half a dozen times for, uh, you know, malice practices. Would have been something good to know, because obviously the client's not going to tell you that, but you can figure that out yourself just based on public information. Um, so, all oh, very important. Um, any questions about any of these? Cool. And if y'all need me to help you find resources or anything, just let me know. Um, <clears throat> an example analysis, again, you can make use of the matrix. Uh, you'll notice very quickly, consultants like good-looking visuals. Um, matrices are really one of the easiest things. You can just throw on a slide and kind of just put things, depending on uh, you know, your own uh, reasoning and logical abilities. Uh, this is one example, right? It's like financial viability to social impact. So uh, lower cost is higher financial viability, inverse relationship, social impact, you want the highest possible. Uh, but if like, you know, the highest social impact is also really expensive and the nonprofit doesn't have any more money lying around, it's gonna be tough, uh, let me just tell you that. Anyway, uh, example analysis, ratio analysis, one out of two. Um, often nonprofits questions such as, you know, what is the best way to raise funds and which of our programs should we focus on? Those are really bad questions. It's not gonna be your problem statement. Your job is to then figure out, okay, well, take that step back when you do all this work that Paul just talked about um, and figure that out. To so work out what activities and organizations should prioritize, right? One can compare the benefit and cost of different amount of the different projects within a group. So again, you can map out all the projects onto a matrix like this. Um, the cost should include both the direct costs and indirect costs. So that's including both kind of you know value of labor hours spent there um, or expenditure on activities. So make sure you're taking into account both the operational and the impact um, components of that. All right, uh, example analysis here, right? Say an organization has three main ways to raise funds. Applying for government grants, which is really annoying, by the way. Uh, collecting money on the streets or holding a fundraising call. In each case, you're going to calculate right, direct and indirect costs. Uh, the activity with the highest ratio should, in general, be prioritized. Find consulting frameworks like this out there too that are a little bit more complicated. If you want to use some quantitative analysis, people are always really impressed by it. Um, and if you want to have some fun with it, why not? Uh, I know in a case competition, we came up with a, a quality index for coops. Um, you know, that's fun. It's like comparing costs to um, uh, the, the kind of 
kind of quality, which is subjective, but given numerically, so uh, that's all fun. There's kind of other examples here too. Social impact of the program divided by cost of the program, social impact of the type of good divided by the cost of distribution. Again, you can extrapolate on it, get creative, uh, very important. Uh, step six, synthesizing the findings. Ultimately, right, the synthesis is the most important part of everything you do. This is what you deliver to the client. If this looks terrible, or shit, pardon my French, the client's gonna think your work is shit. If it looks good, again, much higher chance the client is like, oh, you know, these people know what they're talking about because their slides look good. So frankly, presentation matters a lot. Um, if you don't know how to use PowerPoint, familiar slide, familiarize yourself with it. Um, a synthesis is not a number of facts. A synthesis is not a summary. And synthesizing all comes down to asking so what questions. Right? You figure out all these things. So what? What implications does this finding have on the impact of the organization or on the problem? Right? How does this finding address the problem? These are all things that you want to ask yourself as you're creating uh, that final deck. Um, so again, down here is the facts, right? So I got home and I mislaid my keys. My passport is not where I thought it was. And I'm two months behind on my tax return. Make sure you all do that in March. Don't be like me and wait until April. But ultimately, my summary is that I've lost my keys and passport and I'm behind on my tax return. So what? What does this say about me? It says I'm sloppy. Right? That's your synthesis of the facts. Again, don't summarize the synthesis. That's really, really important. In practice, this looks like this. The facts are the social enterprise has low social media engagement, right? The majority of the social enterprise's target audience uses social media frequently, and online conversations about the social enterprise are happening without its input. That all really sucks. You want to control the narrative of the social enterprise. You want to have media engagement. Blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. The summary is exactly what I just said, but summarized in a nice little sentence. The synthesis is that the social enterprise is missing out on the social media opportunity. Y'all see kind of the pattern here? Yeah. Um, so, step seven out of seven. I promise I'll stop yapping at the end of this. Develop recommended actions, right? Based on all the so what questions you just asked, how do we address those, right? Uh, again, case study, same one we listed earlier. Um, how could the students have written clear recommendations from the start? Um, well, why does it matter, right? In order to convert all your really hard work into valuable advice for your client, your recommendations should at the end of the day be really concise, structured, and comprehensive without just summarizing. You wanna go beyond the summary, right? Um, and summary, uh, synthesis is one step beyond the summary. Addressing those is the second step, and that's really important. Um, so your recommendations should at the end of the day be really concise, structured, comprehensive, um, and the next slides kind of present techniques for you to develop such recommendations, right? Um, so, say more with less, right? Just like the example below, try to use fewer words to deliver the same message. If you've used ChatGPT, uh, which I'm sure most of you have, I use it for almost everything, uh, you kind of have to sometimes tell it to be smart or, you know, be a little bit shorter because it uses a lot of fluff. Uh, as a consultant, you don't want to use a bunch of fluff. You want to get your point across on the slides really effectively. All right, so here's a bunch of stuff, and okay, background, and, and also you did this and yesterday. Well, for these reasons, I hate you, and I no longer want to be your friend. Hmm, that's a lot. This gets the point across a hell of a lot quicker. Dear Shirley, I really hate you. Here's my reasons. One, two, three. Lucy. All right, that's the point you're trying to get across. That's <laughs> all of a lot better. You're gonna to wanna to do the same thing in consulting. Uh, you're gonna sequence your arguments in a really logical way, right? Um, when turning your recommendations into the <coughs> ultimate final report or presentation, make sure they follow a certain structure, like the one illustrated right here, right? If you're making your overarching recommendation, you have a couple of main actions or reasons for making that recommendation, and then you have a couple of facts and analyses to back up that action or reason. This is a logic framework used by basically every Big four, um, use the same one though. Like, <laughs> if it works, it works. Um, so below is an example illustrating the structure um, in kind of a more applied way, right? The nonprofit should invest in a social media engagement strategy, right? They should focus on driving and taking part in online discussions. 
conversation drives around key organizational events and should focus its efforts on platforms that are heavily used by the target audience. And then down here you have the analyses or kind of more in-depth reasons. Um, so uh, another thing, you want to sequence your arguments in a logical way, the kind of storyboard idea is a good way of doing that. Again, if you're having your team meetings, I recommend you do them in a room with a nice big whiteboard so you can start drawing a bit. Um, buy some like Expo markers because they're typically not in the rooms here at Vanderbilt. Um, but you can do this, right? Draw it out. Have an executive summary with high level dots. Uh, the client issue, right? The client issue is described by another person in the organization. Have some data, have some you know, bullet points for stakeholder interviews. Um, have your, implement, your kind of integrations of that data, et cetera, et cetera. Just kind of take everything into account on that one central storyboard and that can help you organize as well. Um, sequence your arguments in a logical way. Next step, right? So we talked about this structure. It's really introductions of the situation, the complication, the question. You wanna have that linear flow. You'll notice some of my slides had a flow left to right, some of mine have it top to bottom, there's always a flow to them. Uh, you don't want to be like, okay, so this is point one, and this is point two, and that up there is point two. You don't want to do that. You don't want to be jumping around. Um, it's really important. Um, to that extent as well, introduction should really tell a story, right? Which includes the following elements. The situation, the complication, the question, and the ultimate recommendations you're making at the end, right? Uh, that's just your introduction. That gives the client a really, really idea and a foundation for the thought process you went through beyond just an analysis, right? What's the material story? Um, <clears throat> at the end of the day here, uh, aspects of the problem you consider. One, perspective, context, stakeholders and processes, criteria for successes, scope of solution, space, and also barriers to impact, right? Make sure you outline all that for the client because that's going to be real important. You want to ultimately, here, look at this flow, you ultimately want to check that your recommendations correspond to the question you're trying to solve. The recommendations are within the scope that the client gave you, right? Um, and any barrier to implementing your recommendations have really been considered. Um, you can, something I just thought of, the client is gonna draw a little box for you, right? Your job is to bounce around that box <laughs> and find the problem as best as possible and then start painting in that box. You don't wanna paint outside of the lines, that's annoying, because then the client has to fix that, but within that box, do your best possible to identify and solve. Um, so, when writing recommendations, right, final tips, keep it short, um, aim to be succinct, as succinct as possible, don't include background information or general research unless it's absolutely essential. Chances are your client knows about this already, um, so you don't wanna like just throw a bunch of stuff in there that they already know and be repetitive. You wanna make it specific, right? Resist the tendency to be vague and offer numerous op different options, and also recommendations should outline how uh, to change, not just what to change. The how is really important to find. It needs to be actionable. Lastly, make sure it's easy to read. Don't use a bunch of buzzwords or you know subtitles, bullet points, graph. Like, like make sure it's kind of well split, well split and set out. Um, and also limit the use of technical jargon or academic references. It's just unnecessary. Simplify it as best as possible. Um, Steve Jobs, outside of his office, had a giant banner that said "Simplify, crossed out, simplify, crossed out, simplify." He wanted the most simple version. I'm not saying like over, like, like, you know, explain it like I'm five, but you want to make sure that generally speaking, things are easy, as easily digestible as possible, especially when you're doing a longer um, presentation to your client. Um, yeah, some backup information at the end of the slide deck. You're welcome to explore any of these. Um, I'll be posting this or sending it your way via email. Um, but are there any questions about anything I covered today? means I did my job right, I'm not complaining. All right, um, cool, that's everything as promised. We ended early. Um, hoping you all enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, I'm really excited to get the ball rolling soon. Thank you so much.